Hello and welcome to Gone Too Soon, a place where we take a look back, reminisce, and more importantly, celebrate the amazing contributions of developers the world over that, for one reason or another, and often out of their control, have sadly left the gaming industry. I wanted to start off this inaugural episode with a team I think some people have heard of by name, but a lot more know via their incredible and varied catalog of work. I'm talking, of course, about bizarre creations, as they were, lamentably, gone too soon. Founded all the way back in 1988 in Liverpool, England by one Martin Chudley, the most British name I've ever heard, the small team of just about five people were originally dubbed Raising Hell, a name that was definitely designed to stand out because it certainly turned a head or two in the late 80s. These Hellraisers were quick to set to work as the UK scene was positively booming at the time and while not their very first title, a distinction that would go to the very little remembered Combat Crazy, The Killing Game Show was their second effort and a very impressive follow up. It was a platform shooter that saw release in 1990 on the Amiga and eventually onto the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis courtesy of all people, Electronic Arts. While EA seemingly had no problem with the branding of the game, it was of course family-friendly SEGA that did. That's no good. For them to allow the release of the Killing Game show on their 16-bit machine, two things needed to change. The game's title and the developers as well. Killing Game Show was then pointlessly changed to Fatal Rewind as I guess the word fatal was much more palatable to Sega, but Raising Hell finding another name took um, a bit more doing. It might seem a bit much now to have to change your company's whole branding and trademark just for one port, but in the early 90s the home console is where you want it to be, as it would eventually be the place that Bazaar would go on to thrive. While a few names were bandied about like weird concepts, they settled on bizarre creations with an appropriately bizarre new logo, as you can see. As for the killing game, as for Fatal Rewind itself, it drew favorable comparisons to such titles as Turrican and featured impressive visuals and music for the team's second effort. Now, while it didn't particularly stand out in a torrent of action shooters being released in the 90s, it did catch the eye of another prominent UK-based studio. Enter British's shit Psygnosis Software, a company I feel needs no introduction. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna look up Psygnosis, they're awesome, you'll be proper chuffed or whatever. They and Bizarre teamed up for their next few projects, starting off with a bit lighter with Wiz and Liz, a magical fantasy platformer with classic Psygnosis ass box art. Oof, look at that thing. The title did well enough for the partnership to then continue, which led to Bizarre getting behind the wheel for their first crack at another genre, racing. This resulted in a plain but competent duo of Formula One games for the original PSX. This then immediately sparked something within the company and would have them heading down a road they would eventually excel at. The year 2000 saw two more titles from the company, an obscure but unique action shooter named Fur Fighters and the Dreamcast gem Metropolis Street Racer. The latter was lauded for its graphics, control, and the unique Kudo system which Bizarre would later reiterate on. Now Fur Fighters was a smaller release published by Acclaim but Metropolis was a first party release distributed by SEGA as the European division of the company, who had been impressed by Bizarre's F1 titles, signed them to develop the Dreamcast exclusive racer. By many, Metropolis is considered to be their first big hit Bizarre had under their belt, but its success led to another franchise, the one that would become synonymous with the British studio. That's a bit of a running theme that you see with Bazaar, as the quality of each title would then lead to more work from different publishers, which culminated in their most successful period teaming up with Microsoft to produce four games in the Project Gotham Racing series. Gotham further refined that kudo system, which would reward players with XP the more stylishly they drove. The game would go on to be, at that time, Bazaar's biggest hit, selling more than a million copies in a month, as it was an Xbox OG launch title. 
Not to be outdone, 2002 also saw one of Bazaar's few dips into the licensed IP pool, that being Disney's Treasure Planet, one of the House of Mouses, Marvels, and Star Wars and Fox's biggest animated box office bombs. Not only was the movie largely ignored in theaters, the game is remembered even less, as Kingdom Hearts would kind of utterly overshadow it from every possible margin, since it released just a few weeks before Treasure Planet. This is one of the few blemishes on the company's resume, and honestly, the game itself is a simple, run-of-the-mill action game, and if this is the worst title they made, they should be proud. Project Gotham 2 followed in 2003, instituting some of the earliest DLC that came to the Xbox in the form of additional cars and entire new cities to race in, containing seven tracks each. Both these packs cost a staggeringly reasonable $3. Ah, how I miss the 2003 marketplace. This is also the game that inadvertently spawned the company's second biggest creation, Geometry Wars. Starting out as a minigame in Gotham 2, it would become a huge digital hit in its own standalone releases, and for a time was the most downloaded arcade title ever, cementing the game's status as one of the most notable shmups ever released. Bizarre would then switch between Gotham and Geometry Wars sequels across the life cycles of the first two Xboxes, leading up to Project Gotham 4 on the 360. This last title in the series would push the franchise about as far as it could go on that hardware and in terms of features and modes, but it would still sell millions of copies. Now, why this would mark the last game for such a successful IP when it could have seen even more refinement can be narrowed down to one specific reason. One tiny little company who took a, a sideways glance at Bazaar and said, yeah, I'll have a bit of that, why not? <sighs> Ah, Activision. In early 2007, after receiving a very lucrative offer from the publishing giant who was dominating that console generation with the likes of Call of Duty, Bazaar signed on the dotted line and became wholly owned by Bobby Kotick by the end of the year. Before that deal was finalized, however, they still had to finish up their last remaining projects for other publishers while they remained an independent third party. This included Sega's The Club, which was a cross between extreme sports a la Monsieur Tony Hawk and lightning quick third person action shooting. You traverse short levels while jumping, vaulting, and shooting in a combo based affair where you then be graded on how fast and stylishly you blasted through it all. EA then also wanted a piece of that sweet Geometry Wars pie and partnered with Bizarre once more with Boom Boom Rocket, a rhythm game that used colorful explosives to rack up high scores that, while didn't reach the heights of Geometry Wars addictiveness, was still an enjoyable digital experience. Now, while both these IPs are not the highest rated commercially or critically, they're both concepts Bizarre could have expanded upon and grown, but like previously mentioned, all that came to a close once Activision took over. At the start, things seemed like business as usual. Bizarre's first release under the Activision banner was a sequel to Geometry Wars, Retro Evolved 2, which continued the franchise's streak of quality. Now, part of the deal between publisher and developer here was that Bizarre had to put out successful projects that need to reach a certain sales threshold within a five-year time span. And while the various Geometry Wars titles that were released on other platforms like the Wii were all reviewed highly, they weren't exactly selling the numbers Activision could bank on. Those hopes would be pinned on two big multi-platform console projects, with one being a return to their racing roots, while the other featured an unmistakable British icon. Blur was released in the first half of 2010 and could be best described as Project Gotham Racing meets Mario Kart. That other high profile project was Bazaar's second encounter with a licensed IP, this time being James Bond himself with 007 Bloodstone. Unfortunately, the high risk, high reward of both these titles succeeding is what sealed the fate of Bazaar Creations. Blur and Bloodstone were both scheduled for 2010, so it was all hands on deck as they had no other projects in the pipeline. Blur, as mentioned, was a high octane racer that featured blistering speeds and power ups to wreck your opponents, and it was something a little bit different for the company. In reviews, there were some concerns with power up balancing, but overall received positive scores. 
However, one week prior to Blur's release, Disney Interactive came out of the starting gate with Split Second, a high-octane racer that featured blistering speeds and power-ups. As you might expect, both arcade-like titles wound up eating into each other's demographic, with neither of them selling the numbers they were projected to despite those glowing reviews. The team at Bazaar, however, felt good about Blur and even started prototyping a second game as there was lots to build off of. However, as sales numbers slowly trickled in, the studio was getting less and less communications from Activision, thus no other projects were getting officially greenlit. It quickly became apparent that Bloodstone needed to hit store shelves and it needed to do well before Bazaar could start up a new round of development. As the months ticked down to November, Bloodstone's release date, tension was high as by then, Bazaar knew something was up. Blur did not move units, it never got any DLC, and their proposed sequel was still languishing in the prototype phase, so a lot was riding on the shoulders of Bloodstone. Some of you may know where this is going. In 2010, Activision was pushing the secret agent very hard that year, but had another great UK-based developer working on a completely different James Bond title. Released on the same day, Bloodstone was up against the Wii remake of Goldeneye, which is of course a front-runner for the most popular movie-based game of all time. This remake came from Eurocom Software, another UK dev who had extensive history with the secret agent, having produced The World Is Not Enough, aka Twine, 007 Nightfire, and dang, they even made James Bond goddamn Jr. on the NES. Look out, he's coming through, he's got a job to do, while he rescues the girl, James Bond Jr. This new version of GoldenEye received a huge push from both Activision and Nintendo as they highlighted it very prominently at their E3 presentations that year. There were also Golden GoldenEye controllers, collector's editions, the whole nine yards were rolled out in the red carpet for this game, but for Bloodstone, not so much. Hell, even GoldenEye's song got to be remade with uh, Nicole Scherzinger from the Pussycat Dolls. Who did Bloodstone get? Josh Stone? Uh, uh, I just, now let's say you're a shooter fan, or a Bond fan, or, you know, both. Bizarre's effort was exclusive to the PS3 and the 360, and GoldenEye was only on the Wii. Which do you buy? While that might be a bit subjective to some, the numbers don't lie, and they spell disaster for Bizarre at sacrifice. GoldenEye would go on to sell well more than a million copies on Nintendo's machine due to the heavy marketing muscle thrown at it, as it was a great example of a quality third-party title for the system. If you only owned a 360 or a PS3 that holiday season, you're probably definitely buying the bigger titles that were out at that time, things like uh, Fallout New Vegas, Call of Duty Black Ops 1, or Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. That's not to disparage Bloodstone, however, which was a solid, polished third-person shooter that also leaned heavily on Bazaar's racing acumen, featuring incredible vehicle sections filled with wanton destruction. In terms of negatives, however, it was viewed as fairly generic in terms of mechanics and had a ho-hum narrative. As you might expect, again, GoldenEye ate into the sales potential of Bloodstone and it wound up with jury sales numbers that violated the agreement both companies had signed back in 2007. Very quickly, like really quickly, just a week later, Activision made it known that they were seeking a buyer for Bizarre Creations and not wanting to blame their very recently released movie-based shooter cited Blur's performance as the main reason behind the sale. Over the past three years since our purchase of Bizarre Creations, the fundamentals of the racing genre have changed significantly, said the horrible huge conglomerate. Although we make a substantial investment in creating a new IP, Blur, it did not find a commercial audience. Yeah, no shit, because you released it a week after the exact same game came out. Mm. Getting into some legalese here, Activision had purchased Bizarre for a cool $100 million, with about $60 million of that being paid up front, with the remaining $40 million dependent on the success of Blur and Bloodstone, which both underperformed. While it's impossible to say how things could have played out if release dates could have been shuffled or maybe more marketing money could have been spent, the idea that the racing genre had significantly evolved since Project Gotham 4 was kind of a horrible excuse. 
I know what you're thinking here. Now, while it's certainly easy to dump on big corporations like Activision for perceived slights and assumptions about how they treat their developers, it's even easier to do so when those former developers speak out. Ex-commercial director Sarah Chudley said in an interview with Edge magazine that Activision would get, uh, quite pushy with the design of Blur. From design meetings, through feature choices, locations, and the name, and even the branding, it was a big change from how we'd worked in the past. Martin Chudley, in the same interview, also expanded upon this. We weren't an independent studio making our games anymore. We were making games to fill slots. Although we did believe in them, they were more the products of committees and analysts. The culture we worked on for so long gradually eroded just enough so that it wasn't ours anymore. A lot of the features in Blur echoed this, especially when you knew who was actually calling the shots. Loadouts and perks in the multiplayer, Facebook-style UI, flashy neon nightclub vibes, all the things that were maybe designed by marketing and not necessarily, you know, game designers. After three months of searching for potential buyers, however, the axe officially came down and Activision announced they were shuttering the studio for good. In a few interviews, former Bazaar staff recalled gathering and playing their backlog of games and went out knowing they had made some great pieces of software. Additionally, during that three months, various staff members looked for new employment and many fortunately fell on their feet at such studios as Sumo Digital, who also specialize in four-wheeled franchises like OutRun and the Sonic Racing series. You can find some additional reading on these last few days of the company in the description below as it was considered a devastating loss to the games industry, especially in the UK scene as Bazaar was considered part of the old guard, having remained in operation for over 20 years. From platformers to racers to puzzle shooters to action games, licensed IPs or original creations, Bazaar was a developer that showed a great capacity for variety but who could also reiterate their work to make impressive sequels that push the boundaries. They never made what one could consider a bad game and were plainly a victim of the overstuffed, content-heavy world the industry was quickly heading towards with a hearty dose of corporate meddling. Bizarre Creations, we salute you for your incredible portfolio of titles and lament that you were indeed gone too soon. If you know of any other talented or underrated developers that may have gone too soon, let me know in the comments below or head on over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon. You can vote on our next subject. There's lots of other amazing developers I want to spotlight on this show, so I hope you look forward to it. And always remember that while they may be gone, they're not forgotten.